supports babies in the womb. And so for that reason, I'm going to support him. So it really is going to come down to that. And I don't know why people try to make it so complicated because it really is a party of death versus a party of life. I can't figure out why people are so confused, except now you're getting into reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. You're reasoning away. So we now have what everybody wanted. He's actually the exact opposite. He's an aging tro Trojan horse with cobwebs inside, like uh, Greg Gutfeld says, and, and now we're paying the price. So hopefully even people that mm -hmm. were like, well, you know, I didn't like this person or I didn't like that or whatever are seeing and then, and then you have the Let's Go Brandon that's like going across a nation, because I don't want to say the other, obviously. You've got this thing where whoever has a son named Brandon, I'm sorry for you because, you know, but we've got this whole movement, and that's America. I'm proud of America. She's starting to push yes. back, mm -hmm. and we need that. Now, at this rate, we're not going to get done this morning, but it's good to get these things out. And more politics need to be talked about, and pastors need to quit being uh, scared. Don't worry about the 501c3. Don't worry about it. You cannot fear losing that, and you can't fear losing tithes and offerings to the point where you don't speak truth. And if you don't know what I'm saying is truth, get in the Word, ask Holy Spirit. I don't care. Search these things out. That's what makes Christianity amazing. So when we go back to this idea of wealth and the ability and the capability to bring the promises of God as a reality into our lives, we know that this is referring to earthly storehouses, obviously. Um, but also, enduring riches, righteousness, and fruit, it has to be referring to something more. So the existence of the glory of God in us is in us and the expectation of that, that more is what we're wanting. So Christ is wisdom. He lives in us. Wisdom lives in us. He is the glory. The glory lives in us. However, we don't want to over-spiritualize wisdom, kind of like we've talked about. You don't want to over-spiritualize. Keep things uh, simple and strategic. The KISS principle. Keep things simple and strategic. I would prefer that Drina versus oh. stupid. <laughs> and so the thing is, is that wisdom is very, very practical and it gets you out of trouble. So when I like when I you know talk about Kathy's teachings being very practical, that's what I'm talking about. You've got certain people that walk in a wisdom. And so when they start teaching, it's extremely practical, extremely applicable, applicable, and you can immediately put it to use in your life and have results. So in Proverbs 22, 3, it says, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Or you could say the simple ignore it, right? So it's kind of like with the economy. Am I in fear saying, hey, we need to sell this house to pay off our building? No. I see where things are going. I went to, we went to Costco greatest place ever uh, yesterday <laughs> we had so much meat and food um, is piled in my car we couldn't have put any more in the car and uh, got GG all kinds of new things anyway oh, yeah. and so we had to go to uh, Walmart after for some little things they didn't have that GG needed and I think we needed a couple things there's already bare shelves mm -hmm. there's already bare shelves mm -hmm. over in Lubbock Costco wasn't but Walmart was um, so the thing is is that there's a positioning. You don't do that fear because contained in wisdom is not fear. But you listen to the voice. What is the spirit of wisdom saying? Now, the word prudent means crafty, shrewd, and sensible. It's an aspect of wisdom. Wisdom is doing what you need to do before you need to do it. That that phrase Holy Spirit gave me has like been, okay, wisdom is to do before uh, or before you need to do it. So I'm going to do what I need to do before I need to do it. <clears throat> that has <clears throat> helped me so much in my own life since we uh, had that debt. Now, I want to read Matthew 6, 33 in the Passion. It says, So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from Him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. So you pray for the kingdom realm of God to enter your life. 
Wisdom leads you to pleasant places, out of trials, and brings unprecedented glory and wealth. We see this with Solomon. Unfortunately, now here's the thing, and this is wisdom, doing what you need to do before you need to do it. The cracks in his foundation were already there. And like Kathy said, God was already talking to him. God was already telling him, hey, you probably shouldn't have, you know, 600 wives or 300 wives and 600 concubines. Hey, the, you know, the Lord, your Jedediah, beloved, obey the law and, you know, build the house. I mean, he, it was like God was trying to set him up for success. But he had cracks in his foundation, which we touched upon when we first started this series. Here's the deal. You want to be ruthless wherever God is aimed at in your life. So wherever he is really hammering you, and he does it in the exact measure and way you need. He turns up the heat enough to where you don't get burned, but you're uncomfortable. If you've got people that are coming to you telling you the same thing, if you're suffering in certain areas, if he's directly telling you whatever it is, you got to say, okay, like in less than 24 hours, rejoice always. Huh. So are you saying I need to rejoice always, which would imply that I'm not rejoicing always. So something must be coming that I need to rejoice always. And sure enough, there were a couple of things that occurred. So it's like, rejoice always, pray in everything, and be thankful in everything. So that's what I've been doing. When he starts doing that, it's like, you know, it gets stuck on a part in a record. He just keeps saying the same thing, especially in a short period of time. You need to drop whatever you're doing. And you need to say, okay, it's obvious you're telling me something here. So what exactly <laughs> is it that I need to know? Because then you can cooperate okay because sometimes we have a vision of where we're going and God's like nope I actually have a vision and if we don't mingle with him then what what's going to happen we're going to go separate directions we're going to get out of alignment with God with others in our business whatever it is in our, our nation obviously so we're going to get out of alignment what is he saying to you? So a quick exercise is just think back to the last week. What were repeated phrases, words, and ideas you heard? Especially if they're weird. Right. I mean, unusual. Yeah. Like you never hear them and all of a sudden, and then somebody else, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the light keeps coming on. Ding, yeah. Ding, ding. The rejoice was one that I kept hearing Absalom everywhere. We've traded Jehu for Absalom. We traded Jehu for Absalom. I kept hearing that everywhere. Um, lions kept, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it, it, it really, it's that simple. So he has these cracks. Here's why it's important. When you start walking in the glory, right? So the glory is the divine essence of God, uh, the fullness of it. It's the wealth, it's the weighty presence, it's um, the anointing. So you, now you're walking in all the goodness of God, which I've still not attained the goodness that causes people to fear Him. I'm still waiting for that. But anyway, so you walk in this glory, right? What happens? The cracks in the foundation widen. And eventually, right, they crumble. So that's why you can have someone that can minister at a church for 40 plus years, never dealt with the cracks in his foundation, and fell. That's why you can have another one that started out fine in Colorado Springs, did deal with the foundation is, uh, cracks in his foundation, and fell. Same thing with Hillsong United. Same thing with Hillsong New York. You got to deal with stuff like pride, greed, uh, anger, gossip, uh, insecurities, rejection. All of those things are cracks. I heard the best, uh, it goes right along with that, but it was talking about the cracks, mm -hmm. that you have to deal with the cracks because when the glory of the God, of God comes down, there's a weightiness to it. Yep. And if you do not deal with that and prepare yourself for that weight, then your cracks, you will crumble, right. basically, under, right. the, under the weight. The weight. And here's the thing. The Lord is going to use those that are willing. That's right. And sometimes, though, they're not necessarily ready. He'll do everything in His power to get you ready. Everything. But there comes a point He's going to move and He's going to do what He needs to do. And so that's why it's so important, like you say, to deal with those foundations. Well, and I think, you know, we talk about 
the goodness of God. And there's people like, if God was so good, how come I'm living like this? Well, if God is so good, how come I'm going through this relationship thing? But like I said, if there's a weight to the glory of God, yeah. and He allows you to have certain things, then that's really a detriment to you well, until what, you get yourself ready. If the biggest crack is our perception of God. Mm -hmm. How we see God can be the biggest crack. Right. If you see Him as allowing bad things to happen to you and He's in control of those things and He's against you and you can't trust Him to do good and blah, blah, guess what? That's a pretty darn big crack. And it's contrary to the Word. Um, and then I think in, is it in Corinthians? Uh, you know, you can just tell we're in a prophetic season. I mean, I don't even mm -hmm. know why I said this shouldn't take long. <laughs> Famous last that. words. Just next time be like, <laughs> you know, just laugh. Uh, but I think, but this is good. It's good to have discussion. It's good uh, to do these things. But, okay, here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And he's talking about the jealousy and the strife. You know, where one saying, well, I follow Paul. Another saying, I follow Apollos. Because Apollos had a very big work that he did in Corinth. And then the Apostle Paul did as well. So then he says, What then is Apollos, uh, verse 5, What is Paul, servants through whom you believe, as the Lord assigned to each? I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. So that, right there, anybody who thinks titles of apostle and prophet and all that stuff are important, that right there, that is a function. It is simply a function by which people can recognize how you function. That's it. It shouldn't be anything where you're taking all these accolades and crap like that. It should be, I am nothing apart from God. He waters. He gave me this function. I operate in it. He gives the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages, wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Okay, so that's the apostolic doctrine. Do y'all remember what Paul's doctrine was? Y'all should know it after Romans. The indwelling. That was his doctrine. He said, you will be established by my doctrine. His doctrine is the indwelling of God. So then it says, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the only foundation we should have in our life is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in us. How does he see us? How does he operate? What's his nature? Is he maybe a little irritated today? Is he happy today? What, you know, like... What everything and how we see ourselves should be filtered through Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the foundation. So anything that is not centered in Jesus is a crack. And it probably needs to be dug up and uh, <clears throat> laid back down again. How do you do that? The epistles. The best way to build your foundation correctly is the epistles. Seriously, in the New Testament. Especially Paul's. So in, <clears throat> to finish up, hopefully today, in 1 mm -hmm. Kings chapter 10, we're going to get back over to our text. In uh, verse 26, it says, Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of wherever. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt, which, by the way, was against the law, and Q. And the king's traders received them from Q at a price. The chariot could be imported from Egypt for 600 <coughs> shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so through the king's tra traders, they were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. Now listen to this from Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. 
You may indeed send a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. Some people have taught that God didn't want a king. That's not true. This is in Deuteronomy, and he's saying that's fine. You can have a king, but I need to be the one to pick the king, right? One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You shall not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Do you see all the cracks? He did everything the law said. If there was one scripture that Solomon should have read over and over, it was this one. Okay? Now again, we talked about the problem of having so much wealth. What do you do with it all? You know, we've talked about that. That I'm sure that can be a challenge like that testimony I gave you guys where she's like, we got so much coming in, we're like having trouble keeping up with getting it out. You know, getting it to orphanages and doing all this stuff. So there is, that is a problem. But here it says, don't do that. And here he was doing those very things. And then look at 1 Kings 11, 1 through 8, which is our, our um, main proof that he uh, did not study and take to heart Deuteronomy. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Good grief. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you will not enter into marriage with them. Neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses, and then 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, which they think might be a Molech, I think. Um, so Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, which, by the way, you sacrifice children to Molech. That's where abortion is in the Bible, in case people are wondering. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. That is the saddest statement ever. Love for God is loyal. That's one of its definitions in the Hebrew and in the Greek. He's looking for loyal hearts. A loyal heart does what he says. That's all there is to it. And so it just, I mean, he was building pagan altars. It's like the saddest thing ever. Well, he was wise, but he wasn't wise in the ways of God's heart. Which is crazy because he had all the wisdom right. from God's heart right. written in Proverbs. And so that's why Bill Johnson says, if you don't live in the revelation you receive, you are deceived. That's why we shouldn't be impressed with gifting. Because gifting requires no particular skill from us. Okay. And so we have to learn to walk with the anointing, but that's about it. So way before King Solomon, God ordained them having a king. But these prohibitions were in place to protect them from wickedness and idolatry. Okay? And it all poop flows downhill. So it was for the king so that his poop wouldn't flow down to the rest of the nation. And so that's why leaders is so important. When you have a leader that's in uh, secret sin, you can just start looking at what the people that are attracted to that church. Just start looking around. Not all of them. Not all of them. But you'll start seeing a pattern. It's very interesting. That happened at New Life. That happened at the church here uh, in Clovis. There's just different types that are drawn into, like uh, even fear. Um, you can have people that will go to church, and they're very fearful. There's like a cowardice in them. You can have a person that's angry, and all of a sudden you got all these angry people coming. You know, so it just... Yeah. That, that's why I'll be like, God, 
Be ruthless with my heart. If there's anything that's poopy, I need you to get it out. Like, show me. I'll cooperate with you because it will uh, begin to affect other people. So, Solomon broke every one of these. His marriage to Pharaoh's daughter for a treaty was a lack of trust in God. His purchasing of hearts and chariots, or horses and chariots from Egypt was a sign of his rebellion against God. The wisest man on the earth during that time did not live in and according to the revelation of the wisdom he possessed. He knew what wisdom would say to these things because he wrote about them, and yet he chose to do them anyway. And on top of that, he worshipped other gods. This opened the door to generations of idolatry, which eventually led to the destruction of both Israel and Judah. That's curses. Yeah. So then you have 1 Kings 11, 9-13. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from him, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. So now there's a higher responsibility, right? Because he has seen him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he didn't keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not, not kept my covenant and my statutes that I commanded you, I'm going to tear this kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, so the only thing that kept Solomon from being completely destroyed was David, I will not tear it away, uh, out of the hand of uh, uh, from your hand, but I will do it from the hand of your son. I will not tear away all of the kingdom. I'm going to give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, David my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I've chosen. So before Solomon turned away from the Lord, we have these words in First uh, Kings five four, but five four, which says, "But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There's neither adversary nor misfortune." Right. So there is peace. Even Satan couldn't touch the kingdom. Why? Wisdom. Okay? Now, 1 Kings eleven fourteen, 14. The Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon. Hadad the Edomite. He was one of the royal house of Edom. Edom. Now remember, we learned about him last time. Edom are Esau people. Long-standing enemies of Israel and Doag the Edomite was from Esau, and he's the one that caused all the people from Nob to be killed. For when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, went up to bury the slain, he struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel remained there six months until they had cut off every male in Edom. But Hadad fled uh, to uh, Egypt, and he remained there uh, or together with certain Edomites of his father's servants. Uh, and he was like a little kid, I guess. So they set out for Median, and they came to Paran, and they took men with them for Paran, and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, and he also assigned him an alliance of food, allowance of food, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him in marriage the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tephines, the queen. And the sister of Tephines bore him Ginnabath, his son, whom Tephines weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Ginnabath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. But when Hadad heard in Egypt that David had died and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, he said to Pharaoh, Hey, let me depart that I may go to my own country. And he said, Well, what have you lacked with me that you're now seeking your own? And he's like, Hey, let me go. So he was going to have vengeance against the house of David, right? Then, here is a servant. In 1 Kings 11, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, ne Nebat what, an Ephraimite of Zeradah, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name, whatever, good grief, <laughs> also <laughs> lifted up his hand against the king. And this is the reason why he lifted his hand up against the king. Now get this, now we're going back to the indentured servants that we studied several weeks ago. Okay, so Solomon built the Milo, and closed up the breach of the city of David his father. The man Jeroboam was very capable, and when Solomon saw the young man was industrious, he gave him ch charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. So these are indentured servants, they're slaves. They're getting a little bit of pay, but not much. Okay? 
So here we have them. They're of the house of Joseph. And at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet, how would you say his name? Ahijah, the Shelonite, found him on the road. Now the prophet had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. The prophet laid hold of the new garment that was on him, and he tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes. Now he's going to have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me. And they have worshipped Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, They've not walked in my ways, doing right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules as David had done. Nevertheless, I'm not going to take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I'll make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, who kept my commandments. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands, and I'm going to give to you ten. Yet to his son, one. Now he's making sure he understands, okay, you're going to have ten. That's it. David, because of David, I'm going to give Solomon's son, Rehoboam, actually two. He'll keep Judah, and he'll get Benjamin, right? So that's what he's saying, and he keeps reiterating and repeating himself this idea, okay? So then he says, I will be with you, and I will build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you, and I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever, Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. Isn't that amazing? So then Jeroboam goes to Egypt. So Shishak, king of Egypt, kept him there until Solomon died. Solomon began to do the very thing Saul did to his dad. The prophetic word is, I'm going to raise up your servant. You should have said, okay, Wisdom would have been, how can I help him? I know it sounds crazy, but Jonathan saw David was anointed. Jonathan gave up his right to be king. Right? He knew David was supposed to be king. He loved David more than he loved his own soul. Solomon should have done the same thing. And if he would have done the same thing, would Jeroboam have maybe not built all the other stuff? Could there have been some type of treaty between the tribes? Could there have been a totally different picture? And what's even more amazing is Jeroboam did the exact thing Solomon did by perpetuating idolatry. So they're all cracks. These are all cracks. So what we're seeing is a reversal, an exact reversal of all the things David had accomplished, all the things Solomon had accomplished. So my question is this, was it because he finished the house and he had no other purpose, no vision for his life after that? He even wrote, without prophetic vision, people cast off restraint. Therefore, he would have known, get a new vision. You could say that Ecclesiastes is the writing of a man who lost his way. And it's a sad ending to one of the greatest kings ever next to David. And as far as Joab, we'll get to him. Don't, don't worry about that. But the fact that he had to go to Egypt and be trained by Egypt is really sad because Solomon could have had another response. So in 1 Kings it says, Now the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom are they not written in the books of the Acts of Solomon? I don't know, Mr. Author. I've never read the books of the Acts of Solomon. And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem all, over all Israel was 40 years. Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. So, as we continue our say of the kings, I want you to always keep in mind, from this point forward, that everything that happens next started here with Solomon and all those women. Women, addiction to women is usually centered in a fatherless spirit or even a motherless spirit. It's an orphan mentality. And so 
That's the crux. That's the problem. And uh, it was God's presence that kept Israel from being like all the other kingdoms. And it's the responsibility of kings to maintain presence. Well, and we saw that that's exactly what happened to David. I mean, he looked on Bathsheba. And then we know that his family didn't even consider him, didn't even call him in when, you know, they were going to look for the future king and anoint him. Yeah. He wasn't. He, he was still out there doing Not even something. a consideration. He wasn't even considered. So, you know, he had done uh, he was not held in high regard in his own family. Yeah, and then you have the, the idea that even the great prophet Samuel looked at the oldest and said, oh, he must be the king. Mm -hmm. Discernment. You know, it's, if, you, if there's anything you ask for, ask for wisdom, because contained within wisdom is discernment, right? And so, you know, Samuel, I mean, not a word that he spoke dropped to the ground. And yet he used an outer appearance to say, well, this must be the king. You know? So it's it's really important. We're, I remember the Lord told me, he said, the Antichrist is going to be so slick, so charismatic, so pretty, that the people of God are going to have to have discernment. Or they will vote for him. You know what I mean? It's like, and when you look at even the foundation of this country and the formation of it, only 25% really were impacted in the war. The majority of people didn't want it. They wanted to stay with Britain because that's all they knew. And so we have to be willing to embrace being uncomfortable, uh, being ostracized, being talked about wrongly, all of those things. The best lesson you can embrace is a lesson of living before an audience of one. That's really the best lesson because nothing else will matter except his opinion. Well, and we look and when all the way through the Bible, a good percentage of the time, it was never the oldest thing. Right. You know, that ended up being impactful or used by God. Yep. It was the second. Yep. And I want to know what the heck was Solomon doing enslaving his own brother brethren as indentured servants? Why was the house of Joseph, which would have been descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, why were they picked on, picked on and <laughs> why were they being enslaved like that? Now, I do know that the tabernacle was initially in uh, Shiloh, which is uh, the, tr the t territory of Ephraim. So I don't know if there was something going on there or if they weren't supporting Solomon, but it's an interesting thing because the law says you don't enslave your brethren. You're not supposed to do that. So if anybody ever finds out anything, I would really like to know because that is a very intriguing thing to me. I have a feeling you'd have to go to the teachings and the traditional probably of the Judaism. Yeah, I could probably do a Google search on communist Google platform and find out. <laughs> Does it well, come up when you put that in? It communist might. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's pray on communist Facebook Live.